Welcome back everyone to Imbu 3730, uh, Special Topics in International Business. And this is our second module, Module 2. And in Module 2, we're studying Peter Frankopan's uh, The New Silk Roads, uh, The New Asia and the Remaking of the World Order. And certainly this book, this major book that we're reading, picks up from our last book, uh, the O'Sullivan book. And it does so by kind of diving deeper into the Asia side, right? So this book has much less to do with uh, uh, Western countries in a real sort of deep look at Asia and what kind of the future of Asia is. And it's not a sort of exclusionary sort of uh, developed Asia that we're used to looking at uh, China, Japan, uh, Korea, uh, but rather in this book, it uh, sort of the, we'll see the sort of Belt and Road uh, Initiative of China, which takes a much more broader perspective of Asia, the entire Asia region. And we'll spend some time looking at that. He spends a lot of time uh, uh, looking at the different countries in Asia and has sort of different anecdotes and stories about them. So in terms of context, yes, this book picks up uh, the mantra of the multipolar world in a much more sort of taken for granted way. In a sense, Franco Pan says, okay, yes, we are in a multipolar world. And what does this look like uh, from the East uh, side? Uh, and another thing is Franco, uh, Franco Pan is very much about what's now. What does the future look like as countries modernize and organize in Asia? And more importantly, how does, what's China's role in this and how does China fit in uh, to uh, the world uh, going forward in the new Asia? One thing about Frank Pan in this book is he's, uh, he's a historian and the book is a sort of very rich uh, historical uh, perspective on modern day, if you will. And he brings a lot of that. It's really rich and it's a very interesting book and it gives us all kinds of really interesting context. It's probably somewhat lighter in terms of data-driven or sort of business economics-driven than what we saw in our last book. So actually in this lecture, I'm going to bring in a sort of lot of data, a lot of trade data into my lectures so that we can get a, a sort of balanced perspective. I'm, I'm not going to be able to redo or even do justice to some of the really interesting writing and context that Franco Pan provides. So what I thought would be better in this set of lectures was to sort of add on, if you will, uh, to what he's doing. And then when you take my lectures together with the book that you've read, then we'll get a, sort of a really nice kind of um, context. I hope to paint a sort of a, a more broad uh, context for you here. So a little bit about our author. Peter Frank Pan is a professor of global uh, history at Oxford University. And he's, his first book was titled uh, The Silk Road, A New History of the World, which was published in 2015. And I've read this book and it's really a fascinating, absolutely fascinating uh, historical book of the East. Uh, very little of what's in that book I had known uh, prior to reading the book, you know, a little bit here and a little bit there, but putting everything in context was absolutely amazing. He's a beautiful writer uh, and uh, really easy to follow. The book's quite long, uh, maybe five times longer than this one, uh, but it's really worth reading uh, when you have the time. So I do suggest that. He, uh, his, he works on the history of the Mediterranean, uh, Russia, the Middle East, um, so Persia, which is uh, uh, Iran now, uh, Central Asia. And uh, he uh, also has uh, some uh, strong knowledge in, in China. And he looks at the sort of contrast between Christianity and Islam. And so he really brings a lot to the table in terms of his knowledge of Asia. And beyond that, he spent quite a bit of time working and traveling around the world. This book is divided into five chapters, but unlike our last book, I don't find the chapter divisions to be nearly as clear. I find that there, you'll see as you read through it that the 
the themes kind of cross chapters. So even in my lectures, I'm not going to sort of do a chapter by chapter examination of the book. Rather, I'm going to do sort of a thematic uh, view of the book. And I actually really found that the points that were at the beginning uh, sort of relate to something that's in the middle or the end and sort of all comes around that way. Uh, uh, so he's not really a topic driven uh, writer, but rather sort of, um, well, sort of being what say a, as a historian would be rather a concept um, and sort of uh, driven writer. There are five chapters though. Uh, the Roads to the East, uh, The Roads to the Heart of the World, uh, The Roads to Beijing, The Roads to Rivalry, and The Roads to the Future at the end. So I was saying uh, the goals of my lecture uh, now, uh, there's sort of three goals that I have. One is to give some highlights of the book, that some interesting things that I found, uh, interesting themes that I, I took away from the book, uh, and some interesting takeaways that we could learn. But then to do something quite different, uh, then I want to add a uh, sort of much more detail uh, view of the economic data that could be sort of superimposed upon what uh, Franco Pan has written. And so you'll find that sort of, uh, particularly once you get to the second half of this lecture, it's a much more sort of data-driven uh, lecture. You'll see it'll just be one slide, uh, one graph after the next that I'll be talking about uh, to give you a sense of some, let's put some numbers around this whole Asia thing uh, and Asia development, uh, particularly in uh, countries that he brings up these countries that many of us probably are quite unfamiliar with. And so what is, what's the sort of position of that country within Asia or within the world? And so I've tried to do a bit more of that. Before we get started, something really useful to do would be to sort of define Asia in terms of geographic regions. Because uh, uh, Franco Pan, I think, takes this for granted uh, in the book uh, in terms of the regional divisions in Asia. And maybe if you're not really if you haven't really spent a lot of time studying Asia, then you probably have a good image of East Asia, right? China, Japan, Korea, and the countries around there, um, the, the countries that are part of China, uh, or arguably part of China, uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong, right? Make up East Asia, which is a very sort of large chunk of Asia and the has been the economic engine, particularly because Japan, Korea, and China make up a large economic engine of Asia. Then there is, and I'm sure you can sort of bring up images in your mind of East Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Thailand, Indonesia, uh, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, the countries that make up uh, Southeast Asia. Um, and sort of uh, maybe if you're looking for images, that your images would come to mind of a much more sort of a near tropical climate, right? Um, and, and that sort of image that you would have of Asia. And in those countries there have tended economically haven't uh, risen at the same rate as the North uh, or the, the East Asian, sorry, the East Asian countries, uh, but they do make up a very important economic group and over the past 20, 30, 40 years have been developing rapidly. Then uh, we could think of South Asia, which is India and its neighbors in Pakistan and, you know, I guess Afghanistan as well as part of South Asia. Then uh, we could think of Central Asia. And Central Asia is interesting in this book because a couple, for a couple of reasons. One is we never think of Central Asia. Well, uh, you do. But there's, you know, it hasn't been a economic engine or a political, um, uh, a politically growing, right? Uh, there's been flashpoints. Um, so as you would say, we see on the news uh, aspects of uh, uh, Central Asia, but it hasn't been the most sort of economically central or important part of Asia in our lifetime, even in my lifetime, right? Um, so, but that's really, that's why I think one thing that's really interesting about this book is because he spends more time sort of thinking about, uh, about Central Asia and its role uh, in this, you know, the new Silk Roads, right? That's part of the Silk Roads. Uh, and Franco Pan uh, is really thinking about that. What's the sort of, that's sort of the next frontier, if you will, uh, in, in, in world development, quite potentially. And so Central Asia is really important uh, for us to be thinking. I think in your generation, in your life and business, you'll, there'll be quite a bit of focus for you on Central Asia. And then uh, there's, of course, Western Asia or the Middle East uh, as... Um, uh, as we often call it. And uh, the Middle East uh, is, 
you know, sort of on the news, uh, particularly with its oil resources and its tensions around Israel and relationships with Saudi Arabia and uh, U.S. relationships with Iran and all of those kinds of things have made uh, the, uh, you know, the Gulf, uh, uh, certainly the Gulf uh, countries, but the entire uh, Western Asia uh, as, uh, you know, as an important focus of our attention, certainly from a political perspective and economically much, you know, from a natural resources perspective, uh, Western Asia. And so I think Franco Pan wants to tie in the relationship between China and Western Asia, which I think is really interesting because it's not something we put together very often uh, as Westerners thinking about China's, uh, the China relationship with uh, Western Asia or the Middle East. Then there's uh, Northern Asia, which is essentially Russia. And is always one of those debates, is Russia, is the entirety of Russia part of Europe or is, uh, you know, where does Europe and, and North Asia uh, begin? And I think that's not a debate that us in business schools uh, want to uh, really take on. We'll let the historians and the political scientists and all those kind of guys uh, fight over that much more than... Uh, uh, then we will. We'll just leave it on this map for the point of the book to know that, you know, Russia basically makes up this uh, idea anyways of Northern Asia. Okay, the next thing to think about is what is this China Belt and Road thing that we hear so much about? And I think that I'm hoping that'll be a good takeaway from you from this book. If you haven't looked at the Belt and Road uh, Initiative of China, and if you haven't learned much about it uh, in your time, at school, uh, I'm really, I think that's an important takeaway from this book in that it's real. And I think Franco Pan does a really nice job of painting uh, what it sort of looks like and that it's not, uh, I've put up a map that shows it as a road and, and, and a shipping, sort of a land shipping and a sea shipping system. But that's a very narrow view of what uh, the China uh, Belt and Road Initiative is. It's, uh, and we'll, you know, I think as we see in the book, uh, it's very much a political and economic effort by China to create partnerships and or control uh, over its region. And I think... Uh, Knowing about this is going to be really, really important uh, for us in business because there's going to be all kinds of business opportunities for you over the next uh, uh, several decades that are going to involve this. Whether or not this notion of the China Belt and Road, whether or not that takes hold and become something that we hear about in 10 years or if that term begins to fade, uh, it would it might fade in terms of language, but not in terms of what's going on, right? Not in terms of what's important. And so that'll be, that's something to really remember about. And of course there's tensions. I was just speaking with uh, some of my colleagues in the Czech Republic and the Czech Republic was really, really excited about being sort of the central Europe um, uh, node of the China Belt and Road Initiative. And that's kind of soured a little bit for now. They're like, oh, we don't know about that anymore. And it was interesting because I imagine in five more years, they, they'll they probably be involved again. And so this is not, this Belt and Road is not something that, well, you know, that was yesterday and so it's not going to beat around today. That's not what it's about. It's really a sort of a very long-term vision uh, by China. And I imagine it's going to go through several uh, iterative stages uh, before it looks, you know, something sort of mature. And I think that's kind of nice. I'm kind of glad that Franco Pan uses the term the new Silk Roads, uh, just because that might be something more general, something more historically rooted, right, than the uh, uh, the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, which is, you know, quite ahistoric. It's only it's less than 10 years old, whereas the, the Silk Roads is ancient, right? And that, that I think that's useful for us. But it's certainly important to understand what it is, right? That essentially China is trying to link its neighbors both uh, east to west, you know, along the old Silk Roads, but also I think kind of the north and south. And that's why I think it's really important not to get caught up in the road aspect of the Belt and Road and think in terms of much more conceptually because there may be much more importance to China to set up a north-south uh, relationship, right? From the, uh, all the way up to the to Northern Asia, all the way down through uh, 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 Southeast Asia. And 
certainly probably right now there's probably a lot of sensitivity uh, amongst countries to that. Uh, but it's, it's something I think that China is probably quite interested in. So let's keep these as ideas and concepts rather than actual physical infrastructure. Uh, although uh, there's quite a bit of physical infrastructure being built, right? And I think uh, Franco Pan does a, a quite an interesting job in the book of explaining some of the projects that are going, you know, very well and some of them that are going, you know, like fabulously terrible, right? Um, you know, his... Uh, uh, his his airport example there uh, is you know is really really is funny right a lot of sort of funny examples that he comes up with uh, uh, because he knows them and um, and so I think that's really that's something to keep in mind that there is a whole uh, a whole basket of infrastructure that will be built and some of it successful and some of it not less so so one question I want to answer is why is this book important like why did I choose this book. And, you know, I've given some answers uh, up till now. Uh, this whole idea of a deep dive into Asia and particularly parts of Asia we don't necessarily dive deep enough into in our own education uh, is important. In kind of a more broad sense, I think what Franco Pan might argue is that the West, you know, and particularly the Anglo West, right, uh, Britain and the United States, are going through this period of kind of introspection, right? Looking inside themselves. And um, they're looking at fragmenting away from their partners uh, and this sort of unilateralism, right? Particularly Brexit. Right? Brexit is, is a, a manifestation of that, right? That it's, they absolutely are looking to be not part of the European Union, right? It's a very uh, bold statement, a uh, bold action. Uh, but even in the United States, we see uh, you know, a substantive amount of a movement away from uh, global organizations in the United States. And, you know, you know, we have, uh, we're a couple years uh, beyond the book, uh, well, well, beyond the writing of the book anyways, and now in 2020. So we can see that this has gone further in the United States, right? We just have seen the United States almost basically pull out of the World Health Organization during a pandemic, right? That's just like, it's unheard of that the, uh, the United States has pulled its funding from the World Health Organization and may continue to do so um, in the future. We don't know, but these things are trends that we're seeing, right? We saw the United States uh, pull out of the Paris Climate Accord and Franco Pan man mentions that, right? And this, it's one more insular, um, action after the next, after the next, after the next in the United States. This is, of course, led by, you know, Donald Trump and, the, and the, his advisors uh, who are pushing for this. But there's support for it, right? One thing we always have to remember about uh, Donald Trump is that while a very large group of people don't support him, still a substantive number of people support him. It's, uh, you know, we haven't uh, reached the election yet, and we don't know if, uh, if he'll be elected again. It's quite possible that he'll be elected again, meaning that there is a large, large portion of the United States who support this view. So this is the context of the book and sort of the, the underlying why now, why is this book important? So the isolation on one hand uh, sets up the context of the book and then presents this idea that the Silk Roads of the world are actually the opposite is happening, right? Across Asia, there is a commitment to trying to work together uh, and trying to find uh, ways of unifying countries and coming up with some common ground that may not have been there before. And not only that, we're actually seeing a global wealth transfer uh, where most wealth uh, was in the Western world. We're seeing a growing, 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 growing amount of wealth moving uh, to uh, certainly the broader Asia, re Asia region. And later in my lectures, we'll look very specifically at that. Like we'll look at actually the data and see these trends in global wealth movement uh, when we actually look at the data parts.